Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 384th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. Uh, I'm Bill Karlopoulos, the New York Comic and Picture Story Symposium, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, weekly speaker series. It was started by Ben Katchor more than 10 years ago uh, as a kind of um, outgrowth of the uh, Occupy movement. Uh, it was part of an effort to create a kind of Occupy university and um, uh, sort of take the kind of education that happens within the, um, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for, the walled garden of, of uh, academia and sort of make it freely available to the public. Um, what that's evolved to over time is a weekly speaker series uh, where people present about typically their work, whether that's artistic work or research uh, on issues or topics having to do with uh, comics or other kinds of text to image combinations and visual narratives. Um, as I said, I'm Bill Cardalopoulos. I've been uh, co-curating this season along with Ben Katchor and Austin English uh, and, and next uh, Next season, uh, Lily Correa will be joining us again, who's, who's worked on the series in the past. Um, this week, I'm particularly excited uh, to welcome Paul. Oh, boy. Now, the question I should have asked um, before we got started, Paul, do you pronounce your name Paul Kirchner or Kirchner? Kirchner. Kirchner, thank you. I am pretty uh, that's what I was. That's what I was always anybody, thinking in my uh, head, but you know, it just occurred to me. Uh, yes, Paul Kirchner. Um, uh, you know, I uh, I'm really glad we're going to be hearing from Paul Kirchner. I've never heard Paul, I've never heard Paul speak before, um, and I, you know, I was just talking to him before we got started to Paul a little bit, and I remember I found Paul's work in two different ways, um, and I, I'm actually not a hundred percent sure which came first. I know that at one point I found a paperback copy of a compilation of a comic strip that he drew called The Bus, uh, which I'm assuming Paul will probably say a few words about later. Uh, but The Bus ran regularly in Heavy Metal Magazine, as you'll see if you have, if you don't know it. It was a kind of surrealistic comic strip that, that mainly featured a bus and a bus stop and its passengers as the main characters. Um, and, and so that was one thing. It was this sort of oddity, this kind of like, you know, almost it felt like a kind of, um, Ubapo type or you know experimental kind of comic before that was even like a genre. Uh, you know, it was just one of these paperback books you find where it's like, where did this come from? And then you know the other thing that I remember um, seeing was, and I think this was when Tumblr was really the major um, uh, social media platform for images. Somebody had posted a bunch of examples of a comic strip uh, that Paul drew called uh, Dope Rider, which originally ran in High Times Magazine, this very kind of uh, cool psychedelic uh, comic on, 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 uh, yeah, that involves subject matter that I think you can assume both from the title and the venue. Uh, but anyway, and, and you know, and this was one of those examples where you see these two kind of cool and interesting things. And then there's that moment where your brain is like, oh, wait, this is the same person, you know, and then uh, you know, and then later on, I started seeing some other things, um, including a, a graphic novel that Dover republished several years ago called uh, Murder by Remote Control. It was a very, very early graphic novel uh, from, uh, I guess, the, I think it was the late 80s, maybe the very early 90s, Paul can uh, remind us. Um, but it was almost like, um, it, it was, it, it's hard to describe, uh, but it has this kind of weird combination of like, mysticism, Americana, and noir um, that in some ways, uh, you know, is, 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 is sort of prefigures um, Twin Peaks, which, which it precedes. Um, and it is a very interesting book. And as I said, that was republished a few years ago by Dover Books. So anyway, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, just in terms of my own experience with Paul's work, um, is that, you know, because I've been fortunate enough to travel to France, I've seen that a uh, French independent publisher called Tiny Beast has really done a wonderful job representing um, real, I, much of Paul's body of work uh, in beautiful hardcover books. And they're, they're published in both French and English. Uh, and the English editions are distributed here in the United States. So there are two books of Dope Rider, two books of The Bus, uh, and as well, 
um, uh, more recent work called Hieronymus and Bosch. Um, so that's that's just a bit of an introduction from, from my perspective. And I will say the other thing that I got to see that was really cool um, was uh, an exhibition of Paul's bus artwork that was staged in an actual bus in a town in the south of France at a comics festival, um, which is where I saw Paul for the first time, although we didn't really talk other than probably just like the quick one minute introduction you make <laughs> with like a, a hundred other people at a festival. Uh, but anyway, um, all that is to say, um, you know, like Paul has a really interesting body of work. And additionally, I noticed over the years working on the Mocha Festival that he had started exhibiting. So I was kind of happy to see this person's available, this person's accessible. So I'm really, really glad that Paul is joining us here today. Uh, to talk about his work at the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. So what I'm going to do, um, so first of all, welcome, Paul. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to read a, a bio uh, of Paul that uh, he shared with us, and then Paul is going to take it away and talk to you about his 50-year uh, career in visual storytelling. So born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1952, Paul Kirchner attended Cooper Union with the ambition to eventually draw comic books. Uh, he dropped out in his junior year in 1973 when he began getting work in that field, penciling horror stories for DC and working as an assistant to Tex Blaisdell, Ralph Reese, and Wallace Wood. Uh, he wrote and drew the Dope Rider comic for High Times and created the regular feature The Bus for Heavy Metal. He collaborated with Dutch mystery writer uh, Jan Willem van der Vettering, perhaps, <laughs> on the graphic novel murder by remote control. Um, in the 1980s, he began doing more mainstream illustration, much of it comics related, and did a lot of design work uh, for the toy industry, including uh, writing and illustrating comics that were included with toys uh, like the Eagle Force and Dino Riders. Uh, and for telepicture magazines, he produced comics about uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which I had many of as a, as a child. Uh, Thundercats, uh, which I watched. I made my own cardboard Thundercats weapons. GoBots, uh, which I also had. Uh, and, and Power Rangers, which were just a few years after my time. He uh, <laughs> worked as a freelance storyboard artist. He worked as an art director at a New York agency, a job he held for six years before returning to freelance. Uh, and after uh, uh, his freelance work, uh, started to diminish, he returned to comics, producing new dope writer strips for High Times and new bus strips for a second collection. As I said, this entire body of work has been republished by the French publisher Edition Vanibis. Uh, and uh, uh, and, and uh, Vanibis is also publishing The Bus and Dope Rider uh, and Hieronymus and Bosch in English language editions and Murdered by Remote Control is available in English from Dover. Um, and that, I think, is enough for me. So please join me in welcoming Paul Kirchner to the New York Comic and Picture Story Symposium here today. Uh, Paul, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm probably going to reiterate a little bit of my, uh, my resume there as I talk. Um, I guess I've become kind of a historical uh, artifact at this point with the uh, tales of uh, days gone by and things that are no longer as they were. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the, the trajectory of my career and try to make some general points, uh, you know, take, take some uh, insights out of it as I gather them. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, 1970, I applied to and was accepted by the Cooper Union Art School. Uh, I was very excited about going there. It was the East Village. The uh, counterculture was still in full swing down there. And uh, I uh, as a bit of a uh, oddball among my classmates, most of whom aspired to be, uh, you know, the type of artists that would be shown in galleries. And uh, I was much more interested in being an illustrator, particularly a comic book illustrator. So while I was at school, I, um, I spent a lot of my time trying to develop my skills in those directions. One of the teachers that I talked to said, don't you understand? Comics is a dying industry. That was uh, a full 20 years before it uh, kind of peaked in the 90s. But anyway, uh, what I would do, uh, 
I worked, I tried to develop a story that I could show as a sample. And um, I had a lot of false starts and I finally completed a nine page story that I was satisfied with. I didn't ink it because I wasn't confident in my inking, but I did kind of a tight pencil. And another thing I did to practice my inking was I would take the drawings that we did in life class of the nude models and I would uh, take, you know, later put some sort of fantasy outfits on them and practice inking and putting Zipatone on them. I, I actually pulled one out of my files, uh, like this kind of thing. And uh, one of the uh, young ladies in my class who saw one of these said, uh, she gave me a little dig there. She said, uh, you should meet my friend, Larry Hama. He likes to make women look the same way you do. So I, uh, I got Larry's number, I called him up and he said, invited me to come over to his apartment in uh, Brooklyn that evening. So I went there and I showed him my drawings and uh, he said, let's go meet Neil. So we got on the subway, went up to Continuity Associates, which was the studio that Neil Adams and uh, Dick Giordano uh, ran did a lot of storyboard work up there, but also they rented space to cartoonists. It was the whole floor of a building with a lot of little offices that where people rented space. And uh, Larry Hama, who had been until recently assisting Wally Wood, had an office up there that he shared with uh, Ralph Reese. But anyway, so he took me up there and Neil looked at my work and he said, um, I'm going to call Joe Orlando tomorrow. So Joe Orlando was uh, an editor at DC. He handled the horror books. I went to see him. Uh, he was interested in using me on, you know, they were little short stories, basically, in those books like House of Secrets or uh, House of Mystery. So he said, though, that he wanted to make me an offer, which was that he had an old friend, Tex Blaisdell. And uh, Tex was looking for work. Uh, and Joe said that he wanted to be able to give Tex a good inking rate, but in order to do so, I would have to accept a low penciling rate. Now, obviously, I knew I wasn't exactly ready for uh, prime time, so I jumped at that chance and uh, went out and met Tex Blaisdell, who at the time was um, doing the Little Orphan Annie comic strip. Uh, which uh, he had taken over after the death of uh, Harold Gray. I can't say that name without thinking of uh, Mad Magazine's uh, name for him, Gray Old Hair. But anyway, um, so Tex, uh, we hit it off. Tex uh, asked me if I would be willing to put in a day every week helping him get the strips finished up and delivered into the syndicate. Uh, and he would pay me $50 for the day, which at the time was good money for me. And so uh, I did so. I would go out to his house every week on Monday. And uh, this was a big, a bit of a uh, uh, insight into the uh, life of the, cart the cartoonist was that um, I would... Uh, I would get over. I would get over there and see that Tex had really only gotten about a third of the week's work done, you know, in the in the previous uh, six days. Uh, he had a little TV set mounted above his drawing table, and he really spent a lot of time uh, looking at that rather than working. And uh, anyway, so we would get to work. There was a a stack of um, Harold Gray originals that the syndicate had given him. It's about a foot high. And uh, I would go through them. Te Tex would have like light, lightly penciled uh, figures in for position. I would go through the Harold Gray stuff, find uh, positions of the various characters that would work, and uh, trace them off on the artograph, uh, which if you're not familiar with it, it, it uh, a little projector that projects down onto the page on a drawing table, and you can just uh, trace it off. So um, Tex was a pretty interesting guy. I really enjoyed his company. He had worked for a lot of, uh, oh, excuse me. He, he had worked as a background artist for a lot of people like uh, Stan Drake and uh, Will Eisner. Um, let's see. Uh, 
there was, uh, well, various ones I can't bring to mind right now. But anyway, uh, he had a lot of good, oh, Al Cap, that's what I was trying to think of. He used to work at the Al Cap studio, a lot of funny stories about this stuff. But at the same time, he was kind of uh, disparaging of his own talents. And, uh, you know, I, I think he had a feeling of not really having reached the level. He would always say that he would call himself a hack and he would say things like, uh, the respect of your peers does not pay the rent or uh, don't spend 100% more time trying to make something 10% better. Or another one I remember was, uh, I'd point out a little uh, perspective problem in one of the drawings and he'd say, what do we got out there, perspective experts? <laughs> so anyway, but uh, nevertheless, he was, a, he was a great guy, I really enjoyed him. So uh, at the end of the Monday workday, at about 11 o'clock, we'd usually be finished up. He would drive me to the subway station in Flushing, and I would take the long trip into Manhattan, get off at Grand Central with this big uh, manila envelope under my arms, stuffed with the strips, go walk down 42nd Street to the Daily News building where the syndicate was, office was. And uh, it really was a different time. I'd just walk into the building, it'd be like after midnight at this point, uh, guard at a desk, wouldn't even look up at me. I'd get on the elevator, go up to the fl proper floor and slip it under the door and go back to my uh, little East Village apartment with, with where I was at that point, I was living with my girlfriend, now wife, uh, Sandy Rabinowitz, who was attending art school in uh, New York also at the time. So this went on for a while, but uh, after a few months, Tex, um, felt he just wasn't making enough money. The strip was losing losing uh, syndication. And every time a newspaper would drop it, the amount of money he was making dropped. So um, it got to the point where he's making about $350 a week and it just wasn't enough. He had to uh, uh, leave it. And he asked me if I wanted to, to uh, pick it up. And for me, that would have been a lot more money than I was accustomed to making. I talked it over with Neil Adams and Neil said, uh, it probably wouldn't be a good idea because I'd get too complacent at a time when I really needed to develop my own style and uh, improve the quality of my work. And it, it might probably be a bit of a dead end for me. I thought that was good advice and I took it. The thing that was a bit funny was that a few years later, the uh, show Annie opened on Broadway and the uh, syndication zoomed up and especially under the uh, hand of uh, Leonard Starr, it, it was once again a popular strip. So uh, in addition to uh, uh, spending the time with Tex and working on my stuff for DC, I spent a lot of time at the Neil Adams studio. Uh, I, I Ralph Reese was giving me work assisting him and uh, there was always work available. Neil was probably the top storyboard artist in New York at the time. That that really supported the whole operation. The, uh, high, the storyboarding work paid so well. It also, uh, if you were hanging around there, you could often pick up a little work, just uh, inking or coloring the frames, you know, whatever you were able to do. So it was a great, um, a great working environment for artists. My, my cat's making a little noise over there. Um, because uh, there was a sense of camaraderie and there was um, uh, shared equipment like a uh, artograph, copying machine. They actually had a stat machine. Uh, they had a photographic uh, dark room. And we could all use each other as models. You know, if you needed to draw a group of people, you just round up a bunch of the other artists and, and shoot some pictures, some Polaroids. And in fact, um, I posed for one of Neil Adams' most celebrated stories, uh, Thrill Kill. I was the rooftop sniper in that. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> one, of my, one of my minor claims to fame. Um, Neil really was a remarkable person because he not only had tremendous artistic talent, he had a kind of a natural authority. And he, he made, he made 
things a lot better in the comic book industry for creators. He was always trying to organize us, to unionize us. Some of this stuff never happened, but a lot of the stuff uh, did happen. And his, his studio there was kind of the crossroads of the comic book in universe. A lot of these guys either lived in Jersey or lived out in Queens, Brooklyn, and they'd come into town to drop off jobs. They'd always come over to Neil Adams' place and we'd, we'd go out for uh, lunch or hang around. So you're always seeing, you know, Howard Chaikin, Walt Simonson, uh, Jim Starlin, uh, Michael Caluda, all these people just going, Jim Serenko occasionally would come by, uh, Gray Morrow. It, it was really uh, fascinating. And because of the accessibility of the studio, uh, a lot of aspiring cartoonists who came into town would come up to show Neil's, Neil his their uh, portfolios and get his opinion, see if they could get a recommendation. And uh, in this front room where Neil had his desk in the center, <laughs> there were always three or four other people working. And when one of these guys would show up to show their work for Neil, we would all just be holding our breath because Neil it just didn't hold back. Uh, he might start flipping through somebody's portfolio and making a uh, little uh, fart noises, you know, just like this. And another time a guy came in and showed him his work and Neil said, uh, how old are you? I said, uh, I'm 27. And Neil said, oh, that's too bad. And he said, what do you mean? What's too bad? And Neil said, you're too old to improve as much as you need to. Uh, we, we, you know, we would just flinch at the at these situations. I, I could never be that cruel to another person, but at the same time, I, I I'm not sure that my own inclination is a bit of a weakness, uh, as much as it is uh, compassion. Because what do you owe someone who asks you to give them an evaluation of your of their work? Do you owe uh, reassurance or do you owe them an honest opinion? Uh, and Neil was uh, of the belief that this is a difficult field to make a living in. Uh, there's a lot of barriers and, uh, you know, if you're going to get discouraged by someone telling you they don't think you're very good, maybe you should just quit at the outside because uh, it's not going to get any easier. Uh, you know, he famously told, uh, um, you know, what's his name? The uh, uh, this is why I have stuff written down. I'm gonna flip was through. It, um, was it Frank Miller? I know this story. When I get my uh, my brain freeze. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, you know the. Uh, was it Frank the, Miller? The, yeah, Frank Miller. That's what I'm thinking. Frank Miller. Yeah, that's the famous story where he went up there to show Neil his work, and Neil just said, "I think you ought to go back to Vermont, pump gas." But the thing is, Frank Miller, that didn't stop him. He, he kept working, he kept coming back and improving until, you know, Neil was, was, was you know, happy to recommend him and start getting him work. So, you know, that, that's the way it was. It was just, uh, you, you either went with it or, or got discouraged. Uh, I myself, I was surrounded by all these people who were just a few years older than me, some of the names I mentioned, and they were already, um, you know, holding down books. They were, they were producing these books. And I felt that I, I mean, to be honest, I had certain deficiencies that just made it difficult for me to, to follow in their footsteps. I was too slow. My drawing especially that time was not as polished or my inking as the other people. And then there was the problem that they, the comics had to be done half up, like a seven by 10 page is, uh, you know, 15, uh, if it's gonna be printed 10 inches, it's 15 inches high. Uh, I always like to work twice up and that, that just wasn't really an option. So another thing is that I, 
had been introduced interested in superhero comics when I was a teenager, but uh, I I just lost that interest. I, I just couldn't get excited about that genre. And I couldn't draw them well. I, I, I think you have to kind of get excited about something to draw it. And I wasn't excited about drawing people fighting and people with big muscles. <laughs> it just, it, I, I still can't really uh, pull it off. So I had to look elsewhere for work. Um, I was, as I mentioned, I was working as an assistant to Ralph and, and also occasionally for Larry. And uh, they had both worked for Wally Wood, and I would hear them sharing stories about him. And uh, a lot of these stories involved uh, some mis misadventures of him when he was on a, a drinking binge. And uh, after I heard one of these things, I just kind of chimed in. I said, wow, that sounds like one burnt out old dude. <laughs> and, uh, Ralph just gave me a really cold look and he said, there will be no disparaging of Wally Wood in my presence. You know, he really, uh, he was a father figure to Ralph. And I, I uh, instantly understood that I had overstepped, <clears throat> that Woody, whatever his flaws and failings, that everybody who ever worked for him really cared about him. And he he was that kind of a person, you know, it, it just, it, you could, you just couldn't help it. So in, uh, this was, uh, got to the point of December in 1973 and Ralph Reese was gonna go up and visit Wood. Uh, I always call him Woody, that's what he preferred. And um, he brought me along. He, he thought I should bring my portfolio and uh, maybe I could get some work assisting Wood. So we went up there. Wood lived in, this was after his second divorce. He was living in, a, it was 500 West End Avenue, a little studio apartment. Uh, he had in, inside, there was a couple of drawing tables, a couple of filing cabinets. Uh, the, there was an artograph, there was uh, a couch that he slept on, uh, some of the little knickknacks hanging on the wall, some frame originals, really nice stuff like Harold Foster. Uh, but, uh, you know, this uh, Indonesian mask, some of these things you'd see in pictures of that he would uh, draw of himself working were actually up there in the walls. The walls themselves had this kind of yellow patina on them from uh, the filterless camels that he chain smoked. And uh, he was very subdued, very quiet. He kind of sitting on the couch there hunched over. So he looked at my samples and gave me some nice compliments, but uh, he didn't uh, say anything about me assisting him. So uh, it wasn't until Four months later, I think it was April 74, I got woken up in the morning by a call, just Woody on the other end of the line saying, uh, you wanna come up and cut some Zipitone? So <laughs> got on the subway and went up there and uh, he had a job he was working on and uh, he was just sitting there, it was for kind of uh, seemed to be uh, moody and uh, subdued and uh, after a while he, he opened the conversation with uh, I just read an article that says there's 10 major causes of depression I have eight of them so I, I I very quickly realized that for Wood having an assistant was not only about having someone to help shoulder the work but it was really kind of a relief from the oppressive solitude of working by yourself. Uh, he famously said that being a cartoonist is like being sentenced to life and life at hard labor in solitary confinement. And uh, he really did need someone to, uh, to talk to. Uh, 
I performed a number of tasks. I would, uh, in addition to cutting zip, I would uh, ink panel borders, rule lines, fill in blacks, which he would outline and put a little X in. Uh, he taught me how to letter, uh, which I would then start doing. Uh, I would pencil backgrounds, which he felt I was quite good at. Um, and I would trace off a swipe over the, his layouts. Once he, once he did a, uh, he often worked in blue pencil, generally. I think it was pretty much his practice. Uh, he would um, rough in where he wanted a face or a figure. And I would go through the swipe files and find something that would uh, fill the bill there. Now, even though I might trace something in there, I think it was mostly for uh, a starting point for, you know, he, he would make it his own. But uh, one of the funny things that I, uh, that he did that I, I kept a copy of is he would get a strip like the Heart of Julia Jones, which is drawn in very realistic fashion because Stan Drake worked from Polaroids of models. And Wood would, I'm going to show you this. He would, this is the real thing. He would cut out uh, like these faces of Julia Jones or Eve Jones in different positions and tape them on a, a piece of paper or a shirt cardboard that I could put in the artograph and uh, swipe it off. Um, it's funny to me that a lot of people seem to be put off or, or even shocked that artists uh, use swipe. Certainly they used to use it even more probably than they do now, but the profession paid so poorly and the work had to be so, done so quickly that you had to find whatever shortcut that you could. I mean, you just, why spend 15 minutes trying to figure out how to, uh, draw a figure of a running man when you could flip through the file and see that Alex Raymond had done exactly what you need and you trace it off and change it as needed and you go from there. So, um, you know, the other thing is that comics at, for most of Wood's career, I, it was, it's really more about, it, not so much regarded as an art form, in itself, but a, really a storytelling form. The storytelling was more important than than the uh, the, the drawing itself. That that just served the purpose of uh, communicating it. In fact, Woody used to say what, one of the little quotes that I remember from him was, "Comics is the art of the cliche," and by that he meant that the visual image should be immediate. It should immediately communicate its meaning. It should not be, or, you know, you shouldn't have to figure it out. You had to be able to see it, get it, and then move along. Um, it's funny, because I read a, a, about uh, the movie director, uh, Sam Peckinpah, was, and he said exactly the same thing the, about cliches. Uh, he was telling one of his actors that, yeah, you just, you change the cliche a little bit, but it, the cliche is important. Uh, you put it a little better than I just did. Um, one of the things that was fun about working with Woody was hearing him talk about some of the other cartoonists, his various opinions. And one of the stories that I, I liked was he was he was looking at it. Jack Kirby was showing him a page he did for Marvel. And uh, in it, Thor is fighting Hercules. And I actually remembered this from my own days of superhero fandom. They're each on one end of a tractor trailer and they're just twisting it and tearing it apart between them as they move toward each other. And as Woody was admiring it, Jack said to him, uh, I did that once. And Woody said, you did? And Jack said, yeah, yeah. There was this time I was trying to unfold this baby stroller and I, it, it just got stuck and I got so mad it broke it in my bare hands. And uh, I thought that is really the mind of a cartoonist. You know, you you got one foot, whatever you're doing, you got one foot in the fantasy world, one foot in the real world. Um, one of the things that I uh, found kind of paradoxical about Woody was that even though he recognized that he was one of the best cartoonists that had 
ever worked in the field. He expected his assistants to pretty much be able to keep up with him. So I, I, I know he was confident. We, we had this wonderful uh, whiteout in those days that doesn't exist anymore called uh, Snow Peak. You could really work over it. Uh, you'd see a lot of it in Woody's originals. But so he was confident that if you messed up something too badly, he could fix it. But he was always pushing me to go beyond what I would have been comfortable with. So as a result, I really improved very quickly in the, in the time I was working fairly steadily with him. And he would occasionally just make a little uh, observation about comic book art. Uh, none of these are hard and fast rules, but they were, they were just kind of um, things to keep in mind in a way. Like he said, never draw more than one figure or head the same size on the same page. And I obviously that that's not a rule that has to be followed, but it's something you want to keep in mind, you know, just, just to bury it. Uh, I remember him saying to be a good cartoonist, you need to be able to draw a good head, good hands, and give the page a certain overall look. That's another thing that I always thought about, the look of the overall page. Uh, he also said, there must be a hundred positions you could draw a person running in, but only maybe five or six of them look good. That's another thing. You, you, you can't just keep struggling to try to, you know, you, as, as you work in the profession for a while, it, it, you start doing things more quickly because you quickly eliminate all the things you just know aren't going to work. So I worked for Wood for several years and the work was not, it wasn't like a full-time job. He would bring me in what I needed when he needed me. And that might be three or four days in a week. He might go a week without needing me, but uh, you know, I had other things to do. I always made myself available to him when he wanted me. And um, we, he, at a certain point, so sort of jumping the gun here, but when he moved to Connecticut, I continued to work on and off for him and our, our relationship really only broke up when he moved to uh, upstate New York around uh, 1980. I actually helped him move up there. Um, back to the mid seventies, uh, I was always right, look, looking around for places to sell my work. And one of the things that I would see on the newsstands in New York was Screw Magazine. <clears throat> it was a um, hardcore, cheaply printed tabloid that uh, Al Goldstein published. Uh, now, what was interesting was that they always had a cartoon on the cover. And some of these were done by really good people, um, type of people that you'd see illustrations by the New York Times or people like Brad Holland or, or Robert Crumb. But all at the same time, some of them were not very good at all even by my standards. And uh, that gave me hope. I thought, I think I could fit in here, maybe somewhere in the middle if not the bottom. So I made an appointment and uh, saw the art director and he told me how to go about presenting the work. It had to be done in two colors uh, in addition to the black plate. So you would do those on overlays. You could get a kind of a half tone by using Zipatone and a solid tone by using Ruby Lift, which was this uh, colored film that you would uh, cut away from a sheet of acetate. So the other part of the deal was that you would only get paid when your work was, when and if, I should add, your work was published. So uh, the first job that I did sat up there for over a year before it was published. But after that, I really began getting uh, published regularly. And in fact, I think I did more screw covers than anyone else as far as I know. I went to Al Goldstein's memorial and everybody was very familiar with me and what I had done. Uh, and one of the funny things about um, the office was that you would think the environment would be kind of creepy, but it was, it was just the same kind of men and women you meet at almost any publishing place. Uh, for many of them, it might've been an entry level position. Uh, so they were doing this disgusting, ugly, hardcore, black and white magazine. And yet 
you know, it was work, it was a job and they had a kind of sense of humor about it. Uh, I remember that in the uh, bathroom, there was a little sign over the sink that said, employees must touch genitals after washing hands. So that kind of sense of humor was uh, existed up there. So in uh, 1974, a new magazine kicked off called uh, Harpoon. Its name was an obvious uh, ripoff of the Lampoon. And in fact, they got a call from the Lampoon's lawyer and on the third issue, they had changed the name to Apple Pie. But anyway, they were looking for cartoonists. So I went up there and uh, I showed the uh, editor this uh, horror Western sample that had, you know, was still in pencil, but it was the one that had gotten me work in the first place. And I still have a page from it. And it has this uh, this character in it, who's a death. He's a, he's a gunfighter, and uh, he's a skeleton. So the uh, the editor Dennis Lopez, uh, he said, "Well, you should do a strip with that guy, and uh, have him be a drug user, and uh, call it Dope Rider." And he actually scripted out he wrote out a little story for me to do so i drew that and uh it was published and then i wrote and drew a second one which frankly wasn't really that great and then i wanted to do a third one and uh, he said geez just wish we'd get some reaction from the readers you know I, I i'm just not sure so when i heard that i thought i think i could solve that problem uh, I had a sister who was living in Pittsburgh, and I had her write a fan letter for Dope Rider, and sign it with a fake name, and send it into uh, Apple Pie magazine. And Dennis was so excited. I think it was the only fan letter he'd ever gotten. And uh, so he, uh, he authorized me to do a third Dope Rider. And that was the one where I really found my footing on it. I... Um, it was kind of like a simple story, but told with surrealistic imagery. And um, when that, I, I don't know, I've always been attracted to surrealism, to the mixture of uh, elements of the real world with elements of fantasy, hallucinations, uh, dreams, that kind of thing. Because uh, as in that story I told about Jack Kirby, I think we live our lives very often in that fashion where whatever, however mundane we're, what we're doing may be, we may be living uh, out some very vivid fantasies. And they, you know, they're part of our actual reality. And you know? how can they not be? They're part of our life experience. So, um, I did, I did enjoy the surrealism. Sometimes it, I felt it added a kind of an underlying meaning to an artwork. And sometimes I just did it to make it visually interesting, just to, just to throw in a, you know, to, to make a picture into a really odd picture. Uh, it was funny that when Neil Adams saw my third episode, he looked at me and he said, how can anybody who looks so straight draw so weird? <laughs> uh, so anyway, after um, after this was published, uh, it came to the attention of Tom Fursad, who uh, was putting out High Times magazine, and he wanted Dope Writer for High Times. So Dennis Lopez uh, gave me his blessing to take it away. His own magazine folded soon after. And um, I went over to uh, meet with the art director at, at High Times. It was kind of a weird situation for me because I'm not uh, a pot smoker. I mean, I've tried it a few times, looks like anybody else, but I never had a very good reaction to it. So um, nevertheless, it was, uh, you know, it was a job and it, it was something I was kind of excited about doing. I mean, it was the same thing with working for Screw Magazine. I'd never really liked uh, ugly, hardcore pornography, but uh, a lot of us who did work for them just did it because uh, it was an opportunity, you know, it was 
it was just a market. Um, so anyway, when I went to um, meet with the art director at High Times, he wanted me to do the strip in color. And he wanted me to color it with Pantone color film, which is done on an acetate overlay. Uh, this was actually a really good way to work at the time because it enables the printer to photograph the black line art separately from the color so that you get a nice sharp black line when it's reproduced. I, I have an example in my little pile over here. This comes from uh, the toy company period of my career. This was a a failed robot line I worked on, the Robo Force. But you can see this is all on an overlay. Um, they had a, in those days, the, the color films were mostly flat, fully saturated colors, but you could buy this little airbrush kit, which, which um, blew uh, aerosol spray past the tip of a magic marker and you could get a uh, airbrush effect like I have in that background. from my little pile over there. There's the, uh, there's Harpoon. And, oh, no, that's Apple Clay. The, uh, that's like, that's the, uh, that's what it, it, it turned to shortly. So anyway, um, went to, uh, over to High Times, um, started working with Pantone overlay films on acetate and it was so painstaking when I first started doing it. I honestly, I thought I was going to just burst into tears. It, it was like making a stained glass window or something. I, I just, I, the prospect of, of working that way from now on was felt kind of overwhelming, but I did get quicker at it. And I stuck with that until, until you could do the color on the computer. Uh, I, I built up a big collection of the, you know, that, that was why actually one of the limitations was that you, you had to assemble a pretty large palette of the colors that were available to really get what you want. So um, the publisher of, of uh, High Times would, had made his uh, fortune smuggling marijuana. And uh, he was a kind of a big mover and shaker in the counterculture at the time. He had, uh, you know, been part of the yippies. He had, it's just like, Right when he got out of college, he organized and kind of ran the underground press syndicate. He got all these uh, underground papers that existed in almost every every city and uh, syndicated them like uh, you know the like the mainstream newspapers do so that they could share articles and materials. So he was a, a pretty remarkable guy. Uh, a little bit uh, kind of a scary, strange person, I <laughs> have to say. Uh, he, uh, but anyway, so after I turned in my first dope writer, he called me at about one o'clock in the morning. I used to keep late hours, so that didn't matter. But he was just well, kind of rambling in this manic fashion about the strip I had turned in and uh, telling me, I, I don't really remember that much of the conversation, but he did tell me he really enjoyed the way I had parodied the cliches of the drug experience. Uh, and I hadn't thought I had been parodied, parodying anything, but I felt like, well, if, if he thinks so, and he finds it amusing, uh, I'll go with that. It's no, no problem there. So, uh, a strange thing happened uh, after that dope writer was published was that it caught the attention of Milton Blazer at New York Magazine. And he called me in and had an assignment for me, which was at the time, uh, President Ford had just shaken up his foreign policy team. And um, to illustrate an article, Milton Glazer asked me to uh, draw a picture of President Ford with a submachine gun shooting uh, Henry Kissinger and James Schlesinger. And uh, I kind of thought, hmm. Uh, now I said, do you mean uh, like with bullet holes and blood? 
and he said, he said yes to bullet holes and blood. So I went home and I did this, uh, this job and brought it in. And when Milton Glaser looked at it, he just knew that this was not going to go over. <laughs> and uh, I tried, you know, the, the, the blood was on uh, acetate overlay, I took that off. I whited out some of the bullet holes, but it was just, this is uh, the late Henry Kissinger. Uh, anyway, um, so he gave me a good kill fee anyway. And what was funny was that years later, I met a woman who had worked with uh, Glazer, and she told me that he still told that story as an example of miscommunication, of having not understood what it was that he was asking an illustrator to do for him. So, <laughs> the uh, anyway, in 1975, Sandy Rabinowitz, my wife now, then still girlfriend, um, we moved out to Connecticut. Uh, we had an opportunity to move into a mother-in-law apartment on a large piece of property in a rural area uh, due to uh, it being owned by a friend of uh, Sandy's parents. And this was like I, uh, a, a fantastic situation. I, we paid very little rent. I did uh, kind of handyman duties. I mowed the lawn. I, I cut wood and that kind of thing. And um, I, by living so cheaply, I was able to keep doing my comics. And uh, Sandy, was who's an excellent artist, uh, was getting a lot of illustration work. So those were very... Uh, easygoing times for us. Uh, this was around the same time that we moved Woody out to West Haven. I would occasionally get together with him and help him on some things also. Uh, in November 76, High Times asked me to sketch up some cover ideas, which I did. And when I brought them to the office, uh, of course, you, <laughs> these were the ancient times before not only was there no uh, email, there was no fax machines, and there were no FedExes, so we had to bring sketches into town to show them. Anyway, uh, I brought my sketches in, and the editor told me that Tom Fursad wanted to meet me, and he was never in the office. He lived kind of like a fugitive in a suite in a nearby hotel. So we walked over there, and uh, he opened the door to the suite. Uh, he was uh, kind of a wiry guy. He was wearing, for some reason, a three-piece gray suit, uh, very neatly trimmed hair and mustache. Looked like he was about to go to a court appearance. Uh, he brought me in, sat me down on uh, the couch with him. And uh, he had a, a very intense look. I seen a photograph of uh, Jesse James, and I immediately thought of... Uh, that when I saw it, met Tom Fursad. So it was your basic hotel room, except in the corner, there was a hospital sized tank of nitrous oxide from which some other editors were filling balloons and taking hits. Uh, that's one thing I have to say about high times is that the people that worked at Screw might not have been the type of people you would associate with that sort of publication. But the people that worked at High Times were exactly the sort of people you'd expect to be associated with it. And uh, I would say that kind of remains the same way today. So anyway, I'm sitting with Tom and he's looking at my sketches and I immediately start talking, blabbing about them. And Tom, you know, explaining them basically. Tom held up his hand for me to be quiet. He said, look, I know you spent some time couple hours at least working on these drawings. Could you give me at least a few minutes to look at them in silence? And I thought, hmm, that was kind of a good lesson. And from then on, I never talked while an art director was looking at the work I brought in. It has to speak for itself. So then after he looked at him, he said, so how much are you getting paid for these? <clears throat> and I said, uh, I don't know. He said, you don't know? I said, well, I, I figured that it, you know, it'd be fair. And he said, well, suppose I told you we were paying you $5,000 for them. 
you wouldn't have done enough work. Suppose I told you you were paying 50 bucks for them. You would have done way too much work already. He said, don't ever do anything without knowing what you get paid. And uh, that's another lesson I took to heart. Sort of, uh, I guess something you learn in the uh, drug dealing business. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, in April 77, the first issue of Heavy Metal Magazine came out. And when I saw that, and I saw the work of people like Drie and Mobius, I thought, oh, God, this is, this is what I want to do. So I immediately started working on a story without any awareness of whether or not they were accepting submissions. A uh, 13-page story called Tarot. Um, I, uh, when I, it took me months to do. When I was done, I called the editor, Julie Simmons. Uh, that's another weird thing in those days. You might actually get an editor on the telephone. And I gave her my fast brag, telling her all the great stuff I'd been doing. And she agreed to have me come up to the office. And I came up there and she bought the story. So um, I felt like I was off and running. Um, I set about to do another story, a 16 page story. Um, again, took me months and months. Uh, and when I brought it in, she didn't buy it. <laughs> so I, I didn't, I think I realized at that point that uh, the, the length was part of it, but also they did like uh, to see some female nudity in the stories and this story lacked that entirely. So I didn't think their readership would go for it. But uh, it was bought by Mike Friedrich, who ran a fan magazine called, uh, he did one called Star Reach and one called Imagine. I have a little pile of stuff over here. Oh, oh. yeah, so he, he published it in this issue and uh, paid me 50 bucks a page. Heavy Metal had been paying me 150 bucks a page. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, 50 bucks in 1979, that's $235 today. And I don't think too many independent publishers are paying uh, indie cartoonists that kind of money right now. So I sold several other stories to Heavy Metal and also then Marvel came out with uh, Epic, which like Heavy Metal allowed you to keep your own uh, properties. So I did some things for them. In the late seventies, I came up with this idea for a comic strip called The Bus. Uh, I originally hoped to sell it to uh, the Village Voice as a weekly feature, figuring that um, <clears throat> that'd be kind of a steady income. But they they didn't uh, they didn't buy it, uh, which was lucky for me because I never could have maintained it at a weekly rate. But anyway, Heavy Metal bought it because it was useful to them to run on the top half of a page where they had sold a half page ad. So um, the idea that bus was, I, I like the idea of taking a really mundane situation and playing it off with surrealistic outcomes. So it's about this commuter that we know nothing about. Uh, he never got a name. I don't even have a name for him in my head. Um, we don't know what he does. We don't know where he's going. Uh, strange things happen to him, and he doesn't seem that uh, disturbed by them. Kind of takes him in stride. And uh, I, you know, I like I like the juxtaposition of the uh, weirdness and the commonplace, mundane element. Um, I chose from the outset to tell the story in. Um, same sized frames, six or eight. I always seem to be able to squeeze the uh, gag into either six or eight frames. And they were identical in size because I wanted the reader to focus on the, ch the change, which might be fairly subtle, which might occur from frame to frame. 
Uh, and that seemed to work out well. And I'm still mostly working that way, although I occasionally uh, uh, try something a little bit different. But anyway, I did that until uh, that ran from 1979 to 85, and then heavy metal went uh, quarterly. And at that time, I had been getting a lot of other work, and I just, um, well, partly I felt like I was beginning to run dry on the ideas, but also I just had too many other things going on. Because uh, in 19, shooting back again in time, uh, in our DeLorean here, um, in 1980, I got brought in to do, or 81, to brought in to uh, come up with a line of toy soldiers uh, for this uh, company called Mego. Um, and I came up with these characters, I gave them the names, I ended up doing the, here's, I got some on my handy here. Uh, I did the, uh, the art on the blister card and for each uh, character I, I wrote and drew a little comic strip on the back, uh, you know, kind of letting you know something about the character, a little, a little adventure. Um, actually, I had Ralph Reese ink those for me. That's kind of funny. I got to have him as my assistant. Uh, he's, he always did an amazing job inking. Uh, so anyway, I, I that job kept me uh, busy for for over a year, and um, I think you know people might think that I felt kind of bad about having. Uh, put aside my own cartooning to do this kind of uh, commercial project. But the fact is that I was kind of worried about myself because doing my own comics, I tended to procrastinate, to kind of obsess over every little detail. I mean, you know, Texas rule about don't spend 100% time more time to make something 10% better. I, I think I was spending 500% more time. And uh, frankly, I, I just felt very unproductive and, and kind of like, how am I ever going to have a make a living? You know, we're not always going to live in this little, little, uh, we won't always have this deal, this apartment, where we're hardly paying anything. Uh, so when I got the the job with Migo and was kept busy doing all this illustration and you know they they just put me on all sorts of things uh, all the packaging and uh, I I my deadline the deadlines and the supervision uh, kind of encouraged me to really sit and and just turn it out and I felt um, I felt better about myself I felt like I'm actually capable of 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 making a living in this business so in that way it was uh it was uh, it was a good time so i never i i've never been good at, at business and i'm afraid i'm still not very good at it and i thought i was doing pretty well with the money uh i was being paid there and one day when i was the art director had an office and he had a, a woman who sat in the same office with him, uh, putting together mechanicals, you know, again, pre-computer days. Uh, and when he stepped out of the room, she turned to me and kind of whispered loudly, everyone else charges twice as much as you do. <laughs> and uh, uh, hmm. uh, that was, that's actually one of the, uh, great unknowables of the illustration industry or, or profession is that what you get paid can vary widely depending on who or you know what kind of work you're doing you're doing and, and who you're doing it for uh, a few years later when I was freelancing at an ad agency uh, I was working in the room of one of the art directors and I, he was on the phone negotiating with a children's book artist they wanted to use for a print ad and uh, when he got off the phone, he, he was just crowing. He was saying, he asked for $1,500. He could have gotten $15,000. And uh, oh man, I, it made me feel better when that 
particular art director was laid off a few years later. But anyway, um, I, I didn't realize back to the Amigo toy company that the, what I was getting paid was actually the least of my problems because the, uh, the checks started coming slower and further and farther between. And I began to get pretty concerned and I kept talking to people about it and uh, they kept reassuring me and got to the point where they owed me $20,000. And one day when I was turning in a job, uh, the woman I was working with, she was eating a sandwich, she couldn't finish it. She asked me if I wanted the other half. And I said, sure. And I took the half of the sandwich and she said, there, you just got paid. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean? Uh, is this place in trouble or something? Uh, the lights are still on. And she said, uh, they haven't paid the electric bill in four months. So uh, it uh, went bankrupt shortly afterwards. Um, so with a lot of uh, time on my hands then, I had uh, been in touch with Jan Willen van de Wettering, uh, but while I was busy with the toys, uh, I couldn't work on this project that he wanted me to work on him with. And uh, now I was free. So Jan Willem, a uh, little bit about him. He was born in 1931 in Holland, lived through the German occupation, which affected him very strongly. Uh, he had done a lot of world travel. He'd written two books on Zen Buddhism at the time, subsequently wrote a third. He wrote one about a year that he spent in a Japanese Zen monastery, and one he wrote about his experiences in a Zen community in Maine, uh, where he now resided. He, he moved there after, as a part of the community. Uh, he also had written a series, a very successful series of uh, detective novels with which I was familiar. So after seeing my work, in um, heavy metal and uh, high times, <laughs> he uh, wanted to work with me on a detective novel. And he wrote out a 17 page uh, synopsis, which he subsequently, uh, it was typed out uh, and uh, wrote a lot of marginal notes and additional ideas and things. And it was very tailor-made for what I like to draw. It just had lots of surrealistic elements and, uh, uh, wild fantasy kind of sequences. So um, we began our working relationship. I had a lot of confidence that uh, with all his success, this you know could be a big breakthrough for me. So I would do uh, sketch out the uh, you know break out the pages and <clears throat> get them xeroxed and mailed up to him. He always, he was always very happy with everything that I showed him. I had to change. Uh, quite a bit of what he wrote. I had to leave out some things. I had to add more things that I felt made it uh, work better as a comic, but he was fine with that. And I worked differently than I had before or after, which was that since uh, this was such a long story uh, and had to have characters that were realistic and consistently drawn. Uh, I got a lot of friends and family to pose as models. Uh, fortunately, I was young then, so I knew a lot of uh, young people. Now, now it'd be more of a challenge, <laughs> unless it took place in a nursing home. Um, and I also use, I based some of the characters on uh, celebrities uh, for whom I could get a lot of uh, visual reference. Um, so, when I finished um, penciling the job, I, I, I all this time I had been going up and visiting with the Anwalum now and then. Had a very interesting play property up in uh, Maine, and so we went through the pages and we scripted it together. And then I brought it back home and began uh, lettering all the balloons and then inking it. And it was kind of an interesting experience for me because because I had worked so sort of intermittently on projects. Um, and on this project, I spent, you know, uh, months between the lettering and inking, just every day doing the same thing, that my 
uh, lettering and ability really reached the top level I've I've ever had. I mean, uh, there's you know it's kind of like a musician with his chops. You know, you, your 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 hand just obeys you to an extent that um, you can quickly lose without regular practice. So, you know that that was kind of uh, I think sort of a pinnacle in some ways for me at that point. So I had, uh, as I said, I had assumed that we wouldn't have any trouble getting this published, but that did not turn out to be the case. Uh, his agent was shopping it around, and this was this was actually we two years before Mouse, the uh, Artie, Art Spiegelman's uh, masterpiece, and no one knew what the market was for this kind of product. One of the uh, editors at Knopf uh, said he saw it, uh, he, he praised it, but said it was more for the European appetite than the American. So uh, eventually, uh, ba Ballantyne bought it and put it out in uh, trade paperback size, which was not to its best advantage, I didn't think. And it was the first graphic novel that was reviewed by the New York Times. Uh, the review was done by Gan Wilson. Uh, and uh, he wrote something which I'll read. <clears throat> he wrote, I, he, he gave it a good review. I mean, I had no complaints about that. But he said, I wish that the drawings had occasionally been a little more ethereal when depicting subjects vaporous and dreamy. Their continuing solidity never quite gets past the, the literal kind of make-believe you encounter in circus posters. Well, as much as I uh, love and admire uh, Gan Wilson, I, I just didn't really accept that criticism because to me, the whole idea of surrealism is to portray the hallucinatory elements exactly the same way you portray the literal reality. That, that, that's the whole point is to meld those two things into a, a unit. Not to, not to make it obvious that one thing is a dream or a, a vision, but uh, to, to integrate it into the real world. So um, we ended up, at, Balthaheim gave us a $2,000 advance, which had to be split between our agent, Jan Willem and me. And it was literally like 10% of what Jan Willem had been assuring me we would probably get. So, I have to say that it's been my experience that the kind of uh, high-flying imagination that goes into the creation of artwork also lends itself to rather fantastical uh, imagining about what the rewards of that work might turn out to be. Uh, at the same time, I think it's that that expectation or that fantasy, however unrealistic, that motivates you to keep going. You need it, you know, you need that confidence. And then whatever else happens, you got it done, you know, that's that's what counts. Uh, I guess Jan Willem was a, a, a Zen practitioner and in Zen, the idea is you, you have to do your best, but then you just can't, you, you, you just can't uh, care about the uh, outcome. You just have to let it go. You can't control that element. So I should add that, you know, whatever the financial rewards of, of that experience, and that was kind of the, that kind of marked a certain end of me wanting to devote myself to doing some kind of artistic comment because I just thought I, I, I can't live this way. You know, it's, it's, it's not realistic. But Jan Willem was just such an interesting person. And uh, we maintained a close, he was a wonderful letter writer. I have huge files of his letters and uh, I would visit him regularly up until his death in 2008. Just a fascinating person with a fascinating perspective on things. Um, so at this time in my life, um, Sandy and I, in the uh, 1984, decided to get married. We'd been living together for 12 years. Uh, a couple of year, years later, we had our first child. 
and um, the little apartment we lived in, we realized we were going to have to buy a house. And I had been getting some good uh, commercial work, but you know that's that's really what I was going to be devoting myself to for some time, because. Uh, after the uh, Mego toy company for whom I've done the toy soldiers, after their bankruptcy, a lot of the executives kind of spread out to other companies and um, gave me freelance work from wherever they had landed. So I worked on a number of uh, toy lines like I showed you the, uh, the robot guy, the Robo Force. That was uh, something I spent about a year on. Unfortunately, it came out at the same time as Transformers, which were so much better that it just didn't even make a splash in the market. Um, it was it was similar when we did the Eagle Force. That came out at the same time as G.I. Joe, which was just hugely more popular. So uh, I, uh, I seem to always be uh, involved with the uh, also RANs. But uh, I finally got a chance to work on a real hit toy when uh, Tycho brought me to work in to, on uh, the Dino Riders, which was uh, kind of a science fiction fantasy about these were dinosaurs that were um, outfitted with uh, weapons platforms. And you had these bad guys that controlled their dinosaurs with these things they called the brain boxes. But the good guys could telepathically communicate with their dinosaurs. So I know it was a lot of fun. I did a lot of work on that. I um, came up with a backstory. I named the characters. I uh, did a lot of, uh, uh, I did all the instruction sheets, just, um, and I also uh, wrote and drew the comic books that were included in the toy packages. Uh, there was a company during this same time, I was also writing and drawing short comic strips for a company called Telepictures. I think later it became uh, Welsh Publications. They published these glossy uh, magazines about popular kids' toys, this one's GoBots. And um, I would write and draw, basically turn in a, a finished product, product of uh, a comic book for. Uh, like how long were they like, uh, you know, uh, six, five or six pages to well, four pages. So um, these magazines, I think they were marketed at the type of parents that don't think their kids should just be reading comic books uh, because they had little puzzles or they had text articles and that kind of thing in them. So they, they had this vague uh, educational feeling. Um, so anyway, I, I worked on He-Man's Master of the Universe. Um, you know, Bill talked about some of these things, Power Rangers. And um, it was, uh, it kind of uh, led me to another stage in my career. Uh, before I get into that, I should mention something my father used to bring up with me from time to time in those days. He, he would ask me, where do you picture yourself in five years? And I never knew how to answer that question because I never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. I mean, one day I might get a call and somebody would have a job for me that would keep me busy for another week or maybe two years. Or on the other hand, a, a company that I had been getting steady work from might suddenly go bankrupt. And that was the end of that work. I mean, I literally did not know what was going to, what I was going to be doing. Uh, and I had no control over it. I couldn't make things happen, you know, as he might've felt he was able to do in his career. But, uh, so that was the freelance life. I mean, sometimes it felt like uh, I was uh, crossing a stormy river on, on, you know, ice flows, jumping from one to another and hoping I didn't slip and fall into the icy water. Uh, but, um, Anyway, the, the, the lucky thing that happened was that the ad agency that was handling the GoBots toy account needed to find somebody who could actually draw these damn things because they, they're you know, kind of a challenge. So they saw the magazine and they called me in and uh, I started doing storyboards for them. And 
uh, that went on for 10 years of, of freelancing regularly for this uh, agency. And the thing about, you know, I, I actually put this into my record as someone who spent his life doing storytelling because storyboards are storytelling. I mean, they're basically like doing comic books, except um, instead of being about superheroes, they're about a uh, laundry detergent or a heartburn remedy. And uh, instead of getting published, they go to a meeting and they get thrown under trash can. And instead of scraping by, you're making a thousand dollars a day or more when you're working, which was not always, but nevertheless, it was a good income. And frankly, I know that some other artists who have been in this situation where they left comics and got into advertising have expressed regret about it or felt they betrayed their talent in some ways. I, I just didn't feel that way. I mean, I always, I always enjoyed what I was doing and I always felt lucky that I could make a living drawing. I, it was not, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like uh, I'd taken a wrong turn. I, actually, one of the things that's funny is that sometimes I actually got to draw comics, like, um, okay, I have one here somewhere. Uh, for a while, I had to draw all the Popeye characters because um, Quaker Oats, Quaker Instant Oatmeal was having Popeye eat instant oatmeal instead of spinach. And uh, that's how he got his powers. So uh, in uh, different packages, they put, they made these little uh, mini comics that I drew. So yeah, still drawing comics. It was, it was it was fun. I got to I learned to draw the the uh, Popeye characters <laughs> very well. I, I had a weird experience because I was freelancing at the ad agency, I always used to eat at this uh, nearby Japanese restaurant every day for lunch. And one day when I was in there, I started drawing the uh, Popeye characters on the paper placemat while I was waiting for my food. And the employees were just, I mean, this was like the greatest thing they'd ever seen. I, I could draw Pluto and all of them. <laughs> They're all staring over my shoulder. Uh, it was uh, very strange. So anyway, um, in the mid nineties, a lot of my work was really drawing up. A lot of these toy companies had either gone out of business or moved operations elsewhere. And the illustration work was dwindling. <laughs> and for several years, the ad agency had been asking me if I wanted to come on staff, be a staff art director. And I kind of, been unwilling to tie myself down to that. But at this point, you know, I had three kids, mortgage. Uh, I, I, re I really needed, you know, and then uh, the, uh, the offer was quite good. So I accepted the job. I knew it would be, it was my first full-time job as an adult. I, I knew it was gonna be, uh, kind of a, a tough tough thing to deal with because uh, where we lived, it was a, a two and a half hour commute into the office. I'd usually sleep on the train. Actually, the agency had a contest one and I won longest commute. Um, but I have to say that I actually really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, it, it was kind of rejuvenating in my 40s to just jump into something completely different. I, I really liked the people I worked with. There was a lot of camaraderie at the office. Uh, there was, uh, I always had to, had to work out ideas on my own. And this time I'd always be prepared, uh, or um, I'd be paired with a, uh, a writer and we'd, we'd sort of brainstorm and hash out ideas together. And uh, You know, they, these were creative people. I really enjoyed it. And it was very, um, it was challenging and it was uh, exciting to come up with a presentation and sell it through to the client. And it was exciting to go on a commercial shoot and stay in a fancy hotel and eat, and eat at fancy restaurants and drink at bars where you see the uh, movie stars hanging out and all that. I mean, that was, that was a good time. Plus, uh, 
you know, good health care and all that. So I enjoyed that while it lasted. But uh, after six years, the uh, dot com bubble burst and advertising was taking a hit, not just from that, but just the, the fact that um, the, uh, the internet had kind of thrown the business for a loop in terms of what it was they were trying to accomplish. You know, nobody know. you know, people weren't really looking at the ads. Anyway, I was laid off, but uh, I still got steady work freelancing as a storyboard for a good another 10 years. That that occupied all my time. I was just, this time I'd, I would either just go into to an agency during the day or, or uh, work from home and bring the work in. So around 2012, that work began to dry up too. And I think it's still pretty hard to get advertising work. <clears throat> and I was uh, contacted by a French publisher, uh, Claude Amouguet, who um, was starting a company and he wanted to put out the bus as a uh, his first publication. So we worked on that and um, <clears throat> I was, um, very pleased with the quality that he put into it. He's really like determined to just produce a top-notch product. So after that came out, I thought, I wonder, the first thing that occurred to me was we should do volume two. And I wasn't really sure if I could still come up with uh, ideas like that because uh, I was a middle-aged man and these, these were the products of my youthful energy and hormones and fully functioning neural synapses. I just, I, uh, I thought, you know, maybe I've been uh, corrupted by, by my years of advertising or something. But nevertheless, I uh, put my mind to it and the idea started bubbling up and I started drawing more bus strips. Then I started thinking that I should try to find a place where I could get them published as I finished them a magazine, much as heavy metal had done. Uh, that way I could generate a little income. And I tried uh, a few places. I tried uh, uh, Mad Magazine, but they told me that if they ran it, they would own it. They would own the property. I had a lot of equity in that property, so that just wasn't going to happen. Um, there was uh, heavy metal, it, you know, it was one in one of its brief resurgences. I think it's not running right now, but they ran some of them. They paid 40 bucks each. The last time I had done them for them in the 80s, it was 200 bucks each. Now it was 40 bucks each. Oh boy. But anyway, um, so I'm still doing that. I'm still working on a, yet a third book. And th there's some challenges to doing the bus that uh, <laughs> made me think about some things in comics. Like, uh, for example, one is that since I started it, I started it in the 70s. And there hasn't been a bus that looked like that on the streets in the last 30 years. But I felt like it's an established character and I just can't change it to one of these new boxy buses i see uh the other thing was that the the commuter uh he's always like reading the newspaper it's like a handy prop for me to have him uh, being engrossed in and it just didn't seem to be right to have him be looking at a cell phone but who reads a the newspaper these days <laughs> you know you don't you don't see someone sitting on the bus reading a newspaper but I just don't feel like it could change it. And I and I thought it reminded me of these comic strips that I used to see when I grew up, you know, things like Mutton Chef or uh, Bringing Up Father, where the people, the, these comic strips had been started in the 30s and 40s and, and they were still dressed the same way. Everything looked like the, a relic of that period. And here I find myself in that same uh, bind, you know. Um, the other thing about it is that since it's always variations on the same theme, I wonder whether there's eventually gonna be an end to it. You know, I, I, I don't wanna like just do a variation of a gag. I want it to be enough different that, you know, that, I, that I'm satisfied that it's different. And, and that's a tricky thing because <clears throat> I realize that I'm not 
limited by the number of potential situations. What I am limited by is the tracks on which my mind works, runs, you know, the ruts. Um, I, I, you know, inevitably I tend to think in certain ways and come up with certain types of jokes. But I feel like if I were to find a different cartoonist and give them the strip and their mind worked in different ways, they would come up with a whole slew of different bus cartoons, you know, uh, that's just the way it is. I, I, I but uh, anyway, I keep, um, uh, I keep at it. So while I had done these bus trips, uh, one of the places that I brought them or sent them to consider publishing was my uh, old High Times magazine, which to my amazement was still in production. And they didn't want to run the bus, but they said, look, our 40th anniversary issue is coming up. Your first comic appeared in the first anniversary issue. How would you like to do us another dope writer story? So again, I thought, am I even capable of it? <laughs> but I did it and uh, they loved it. The guy, uh, gave me, did, the editor did the little uh, John Lennon voice, you know, you passed the audition. <laughs> so anyway, they told me that, they asked me if I could do a page a month from then on. So uh, that's what I've been doing. Uh, starting in January, 2015, I've been doing a page every month for high times. And I really enjoy it. It's, it's hard to tell much of a story, but, um, I do like to pay it off, you know, I, to pay it off in a humorous way. But the humor really comes a lot from the surrealism of the images, the absurdity of the images. And the other thing about it is, even though it has a kind of a Western theme, and I like to always touch on that, I can literally do anything I want with it. So I don't feel that I'll run out of gas with that. I mean, it's always on my mind. I'm always thinking about it. What am I going to do next? And it takes me about a week. Once I have the idea, it's about a week from start to finish because I'm doing the, you know, the whole thing. So I, um, to give you an idea of how I work, I first take a scrap piece of uh, eight and a half by 11 paper, usually something that we printed something on the other side of, you know, just a pile of scrap paper we have here. And I start roughing out, uh, you know, how, what, what would be in each panel? I mean, not really, just scribbling in uh, ideas. And once I see how it's gonna work, <laughs> I um, take a sheet of the three-ply Strathmore that I draw on and I rule the size of the page, which is about 14 by 20 in pencil in the center of the page. And then I tape a piece of tracing paper over it and begin um, drawing the frames. And I like working on tracing paper because it's very easy to erase it cleanly. And at this stage, I'm doing a lot of erasing. And I'm really putting a lot of thought into uh, each frame, how, um, what I need to show, the size of it, you know, the camera angle, the, uh, I think about the relationship of the panels to each other. And sometimes I'll change my mind. I'll think, oh, this panel's too big. It doesn't need to be that big, the other one. So what I'll do then, I don't know if this will be very visible. Um, what I'll do is, uh, this is a, a one example of one of the most recent ones I did. This is, uh, I, I Xeroxed some of the drawings and let's say I reduced them like 85% because I felt that I needed to give more room to something else, less room to this. So I would Xerox it down and paste it on my tracing paper. Um, these are still pretty rough, but on a, put it on the light table I trace it off on the good paper, in pe lightly in pencil, tighten it up, and then ink it. And uh, when it looks done, I'm done. Um, sometimes uh, 
sometimes it doesn't always turn out as well as you hoped it would. And sometimes it does, but you never know until it's done. I was pretty happy with that page. It's, uh, I don't know. It's not out yet, I don't think. <laughs> um, so anyway, after I do the inking, I scan it and I do my coloring on the uh, on Photoshop. I like using flat colors. I think they look best with the uh, black line. Don't really like airbrush effects, although I occasionally use them. And I also like to do my balloons and my lettering on the uh, computer as well. Now in the indie comics world, I think that's considered kind of de classe to uh, use computer lettering. But I, I am constantly rewriting the stuff as I work. When I draw it, I start, you know, getting other ideas. And literally that's the, the last thing I put to bed is the dialogue. And if I were lettering it onto the page, I, I, I just, it just wouldn't work for me. Uh, you know, I'll wake up in the middle of the night when I think of almost done and I'll suddenly, think, oh, it'd be funnier. It'd be funnier if he did this, said this, you know, whatever. I want to have that flexibility to keep improving the dialogue. And, and actually having the lettering and uh, balloons on a Photoshop layer is very handy when this stuff is published overseas as it has been and they can uh, translate it, you know, different languages the text takes uh, more or less room and I, this way it's more easily accommodated. So turning another page, the creative process. Um, I read something funny that the uh, writer uh, P.G. Woodhouse said, he said, um, if a literary scholar had the opportunity to ask uh, John Milton how he came about to write uh, Paradise Lost, he'd probably get an answer along the lines of, well, you know, it's just one of these things that just sort of pops into your head, you know? Leaving the literary scholar not much better off than when he started it. But that is uh, not too far from the truth. You know, sometimes things just pop into your head. Uh, they especially pop into your head at what they call the uh, hypnagogic state. That is this transitional state between wakefulness and sleep. Lying in bed at night, uh, I think you're very close to your subconscious mind, which is the, uh, the wellspring of creativity. Uh, so if I have a problem I've been mulling over, that's often when the solution comes. The, um, but I, at the same time, I think that the subconscious has to be given a task. Like right now, my subconscious has the task of coming up with dope writer ideas. And it manages to kick out one, at least one every month for me to meet my deadline. But I did a book a few years ago called Hieronymus and Bosch. And I don't plan to do a sequel. And I haven't gotten any more ideas for Hieronymus and Mosh cartoons. I've taken my subconscious mind off that uh, chore. It needs to be focused on productive things. So uh, I do keep a couple of blank notebooks, one for Dope Rider and one for the bus. And every time I get a sort of odd idea that I think might have potential, I jot it down in these books. And uh, sometimes I'll actually get a pretty uh, complete idea. And that, that's very fortunate. But often what happens is that I'll look a few months later, I'll look at an idea that I couldn't figure out what to do with. And suddenly, maybe my subconscious mind has been uh, quietly uh, grinding away at it. But suddenly it'll occur to me how to uh, make it into a strip. Or uh, I may be looking, leafing through the booklet and realize if two of the ideas were put together, they would make a coherent story. So, um, you know, that it's handy to have all those things in one of those little blank, uh, uh, no, you know, books, bound books that they, they have. Sometimes an idea comes from something I read or hear and just sparks something. Like I read the biography of, uh, 
Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And in it, he mentions that, or the author mentions, that he once told studio musicians to imagine that they had been absorbed into their instruments. And then I thought, hey, you know, what if Dope Rider was absorbed into his bong? So I got a story out of that one. So another thing I wanna say is that um, the idea itself is not enough because you need your rational mind to process it into something comprehensible to the reader or the viewer as the case may be. Um, and you have to be objective enough. I mean, unless you're just working for your own amusement, if you're really thinking about an audience, you have to be objective enough to, about your own work to say, does this make sense? Will this make sense to another person? Is this amusing? Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that, that to, uh, the, you have to step back and judge the idea uh, as to whether it's going to work or not. Another thing is that even the process of drawing, I think, opens a channel to the subconscious because it's often when I start drawing or in the middle of drawing something that I'll suddenly think, wait a minute, I know what would be better than what I'm doing right now. I might be doing something rather um, straightforward. And I think, wait a minute, it'd be much fun here if whatever, you know, some, something crazy is going on in the background or the situation. So um, I usually, I don't like to talk about ideas until they're on the paper, because I think that talking about them vents some of the creative energy that you need to actually get them done. And you need to channel all that energy into putting it on the paper. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that if you start talking about ideas and getting negative feedback on them, you start losing confidence right at the outset, uh, maybe from someone who doesn't even understand what you have in mind. So I don't do it. <laughs> even with my beloved wife, I, she, knows, she knows I'm not going to talk about something when I'm in the middle of it. Uh, but when it's done, I always go to her for her uh, opinion or judgment. And sometimes uh, she's the one that tells me, you know what, this is this is not clear and I fix it. Uh, of course, since I do Dope Writer for High Times, a lot of people think I must be using drugs. I I don't know. I I think I need to be clear headed. I I I'm afraid of messing with whatever goes on in my head. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I've I've read artists, you know, Robert Crumb famously took some bad acid and uh, took six months to recover and has said that that produced the, 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 the best work that he ever did. All the characters that he created were during that period. It, it really, uh, you know, to me, it's very evident that, that he made a major breakthrough. And, and really my favorite of all artists, Mobius, he um, also attributes his adoption of the Mobius identity uh, to uh, mushrooms that he took in Mexico and uh, also his uh, weed smoking. But uh, so far I just haven't, and maybe I'll save it for later. <laughs> uh, as far as the artistic style, I think that develops naturally. I think at the beginning of the artist's career, they um, often emulate someone that they admire, but as they work, I think it's almost like their signature your style will develop into its own, even if the roots of it may still be evident. Like I think the roots of Grand Ingalls style were always evident in the work of uh, Bernie Wrightson, but obviously he, you know, he, he took it to a higher level in my opinion <laughs> anyway. Uh, when I worked for Wood, my um, my style was strongly influenced by him, so much so that uh, uh, some of the work that I did was credited to him. Uh, I had to straighten some people out on that. Uh, another thing that about style is that I think whatever the strongest element of a artist's style is, it comes with a concurrent weakness in another direction. Like if your style is very strong in one way, 
uh, I mean, maybe weakness isn't the, the right word exactly, but you lose something in the opposite direction. And I thought it was interesting that I heard Neil Adams, who is so renowned for his bringing, having brought this realism to comics, uh, say that he draws more realistically than Jack Kirby, but Jack Kirby is able to communicate more energy than he is because Jack Kirby does not confine him, did not confine himself to strict realism. I mean, instead of anatomy, Kirby was drawing sort of lines of energy. And Neil acknowledged that there's something in his, in, in Kirby's work that's better in that way than in Neil's own. And at this point, I, I have to say, I always respected Neil uh, uh, definitely, and I always respected his work. I mean, he's a fantastic artist, but I didn't love it. That's one of these um, subjective things. There are artists like someone like Mobius. I mean, I ju I just love what he does, but Neil's work was just not not to my taste. You know, that's um, it's subjective. It's like uh, people like uh, Mobius or Rick Griffin. I, I just was, or uh, another one was Tank Girl. When I started looking at that, I was just so blown away by it. Uh, which brings me to an idea that I had. Uh, I think I first heard about Sir Sturgeon's Law from uh, Wally Wood. Wally Wood was a big uh, science fiction reader. And uh, Sturgeon, I think he was asked whether or not he would acknowledge that 90% of science fiction is crap. And he said, sure, 90% of science fiction is crap, but 90% of everything is crap. And uh, I thought about that and I would have a slightly different take on it because I think the point is that out of any form of art, whether it's music or comics, whatever, there's only 10% that's going to be to your taste, 10% that you love. The other 90% may, it's not crap necessarily. Maybe some of it is crap, but 90% of it isn't crap. But it's somebody else's taste. Your 10% is in someone else's 90%, and their 10% is in your 90%. I, I mean, I, I see that all the time when I hear people talk about the movies they like or the music they like. It's it's a subjective thing. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I don't like to say negative things about other people's work. If they're, you know, it's just not to my taste, that's fine. So it's to someone else's taste. And uh, the other thing is that in this line of work, nobody goes into it to, as a kind of a get rich quick scheme. I mean, they go into it out of love. And I have to respect that. And if they found an audience, then more power to them. I'm not gonna, you know, uh, just dump on on what I don't like about it or you know my particular opinion. It's 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 not really my business. Uh, I told uh, I, I once had a conversation with my publisher uh, Claude when we were at a convention. There's another car artist he published is um, even Ivan Brun, who's just a fantastic artist. I mean, he's done a lot of record album covers and prints. And I was telling, I was just expressing my imagine, my uh, admiration to Claude, just saying like, God, he is so much of a better artist than I am. And Claude said, he thought about it for a moment and he said, uh, in his accent, he is a better artist, but you are a better comic book artist. <laughs> and uh, I think what he meant by that was that comics is really about storytelling. And it's not about the individual, uh, it's not about the beauty of the individual frames. It's, it's, about, it's about the page, it's about the, the story. Uh, I think back to one of the things that drove uh, Woody Crazy, which uh, kind of a perennial complaint of his was going to conventions and meeting fans who would tell him, your old stuff was better. 
Now, I used to think that he just resented that because, you know, there are a lot of us who may look back on some of our early work and feel that it had a kind of vitality and energy that we haven't been able to maintain. But I think it was different with Woody. I think he was, I personally feel that a lot of his early work, as beautifully done as it was, kind of um, was too cluttered. There was too much stuff going on in each frame, kind of lacked a focus. And uh, I think some of the stuff that he did later uh, was better. And he resented the fact that what the fans were just reacting to was the detail, the amount of detail. The more detail you cram, cram into a frame, the better. The more rendering it has, the better. Uh, I, I think that's a perennial uh, disappointing thing about fan taste, you know, that uh, granted there are exceptions, I'm sure, but uh, I think as Wood got um, more mature, like Alex Toth, he realized that the things you leave out are as important as the things that you put in. Uh, a few years ago when I was at a convention, someone came over to my table and paid me a compliment that I very much appreciated. He said that he uh, admired my visual imagination. And that, that struck me because I know that there are a lot of artists that draw better than I do. I, 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 <laughs> I don't doubt that at all. I just looking at them. But I do think that I have a good visual imagination. And the fact is, you can be a very good artist and produce only banal images. I mean, how many times do we have to see these uh, drawings, very nicely drawn drawings of, you know, Batman standing in a, uh, you know, a night scene with a terrible scowl on his face and he's hunched over and clenching his fist. And, you know, I just, I think who needs this? Who needs these, these cliches or these beautifully rendered fantasy paintings of the, muscle bound guy with the sword and the nearly naked woman and the dragon. And, you know, I look at, I, I admire the technique, but I think, you know, is, hasn't this been done to death already? What, what, what are we, what are we accomplishing with this stuff? So, um, I think the, uh, you know, what, what you draw is at least as important as how well you draw it. And you have to have an image in your head before you can put it on the paper. So that's my feeling about that. A lot of uh, cartoonists have to work with a writer. Uh, they can't come up with their own stories. And I would have uh, never had a career if I hadn't been able to think of my own stories. Uh, I heard that uh, Will Eisner said something like, the writer and artist should work together as closely as possible, ideally in the same body. And I think that's a good sentiment. I've always wanted to do my own ideas because I need to get kind of excited about something in order to work up the energy to visualize it and draw it. And, you know, when the idea is all mine, uh, you know, that's the way it works. The other thing is that I've always wanted to keep ownership of my work and you don't have that if you're sharing ownership with a writer. Uh, the situation with murder by remote control has gotten kind of complicated because um, the rights are shared with uh, Jan Willem's uh, estate and they're re really not very easy to work with. So I, uh, I won't make that mistake again. I, um, when I was, uh, you know, as far as, being able to write my own stuff. That's really why I was able to get work with these, uh, you know, with telepictures and with uh, these companies was because I could, the toy companies doing those little comic books was that I could produce a finished product. And for them, that was very useful. They didn't have to search around for all these people and get everyone together. You know, I would just take the project on and take it from start to finish, made life much easier for them.
at the same time, I realized that I'm not really capable of writing regular comics with uh, complicated characters and story arcs and all that kind of thing. I write little stories or little fables, I think, uh, or gags. <laughs> That's kind of the extent of my uh, writing ability and uh, I'm fine with that. So back to comics, uh, my commercial stage of my career is over my comics is ongoing and I'm very grateful that I'm able to do it, able to get published and uh, people seem to appreciate it. So that's about all I have to say tonight. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, Paul? yeah. That was great. Thank you. Well, somehow my image got all blurry and I don't know how to fix that right now. Um, I, I Sorry about that. Um, but uh, there's this fog that just rolled in here uh, in the conference room. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, this is not my normal computer. Um, but no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but I did want to just, I mean, I, I, I was taking some, some notes, but um, I, well, the one thing I just want to say really quickly, Paul, is that what what impressed me about your talk is, you know, it seems like when you were coming up, you were so attentive and sensitive to the lessons that you could learn from mentor figures, whether it was Neil Adams or Wallace Wood or some of these other folks you came into contact with. And I'm just very appreciative that you've passed that along to uh, the audience uh, here tonight and everyone who's going to um, wa watch your presentation online because you've shared both the, the things that have been important to you that you learned from other people, but also the things that you've learned yourself. Um, and I'm really glad, you know, and, and I think there's also a really important thing too, you know, there's I think, you know, as you were saying, sometimes people feel like they have to make that choice of, you know, am I doing my personal art or doing commercial work? And, and you know, there's, I feel the almost this kind of Puritan idea sometimes that if you cross a certain line, you can never go back or something. But no, I mean, you know, it's like people are complicated. The brain it has a neuroplasticity, you know, and, and, and as you say, the subconscious is always churning. I mean, a lot of what you said about that reminds me of things Kim Deitch has said too about kind of, you know, it's like if he's having a problem, a creative problem, he looks at it and thinks about it before he goes to bed. And then the next day, you know, often, uh, you know, a solution kind of falls into place. Um, but as I said, we, we, we're close to the end of our time, but somebody here, Howard Robot, has asked a question. Howard, do you want to ask out loud or would you like for me to read this? Wow. Well, um... uh, Okay, Howard uh, Howard is asking, can you provide an example of how you go from concept to finished strip for the bus? Uh, and, he's, and, and Howard is particularly interested in the representational problems involved in communicating an idea. Yeah, no, you know, I, I, I can't answer that quickly. I, 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 uh, <laughs> I would have to, I would have to put a lot of thought into that. I, yeah. Um, you know, I didn't realize I was running this long because. Oh, uh, it's all right. No, listen, hey, we're grateful. Thank you so much. You know, I um, no, and, and I just want to say a couple of things. Um, if if uh, no one else has any questions, people are offering their thanks right now. Um, but a couple of things I'd like to note is that, you know, we do have, you know, in my other capacity as the programming director for the MOCA Festival, I'll just note that we have the MOCA. Oh, finally, my focus is back. Uh, we have the MOCA Festival coming March 16th and 17th, and Paul is going to be there, and Paul is going to be on a panel uh, with some other really great artists, uh, and you'll be there with your French publisher, Edition Fanny Bis, uh, and you'll have all of your stuff there. Um, and next week at the symposium, our guest will be the author and film director, Nicholas Meyer, uh, who will talk about uh, the Will, Eis Will Eisner's influence on his own work as our, as our Will Eisner Week uh, presentation next week. And that's at March 5th, and that'll be at 6 p.m. We usually meet at 7 p.m. Um, but, that, but thank you so much, Paul. That was really wonderful. And, and um, um, so is, if I understand correctly, I mean, you're working on the book of, you're working on the bus three now and still doing the monthly dope rider for high times. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I encourage everyone to uh, 
catch up on any books from the Paul Kirchner Library they're missing, and you can. Uh, you yeah, can I, still... have, um, I should mention uh, I do have a a site where I sell my books. It's just www.paulkirchner.com, and uh, if you buy them from me instead of from Amazon or eBay, I um. You know they they take like a almost a third of the uh, money you know so it's much better if I could sell them directly. And, and not only that, but I think uh, they they tend to come personalized or something, or they can. Oh yeah, right? I, I do a little drawing and everything. Yes, the other, I, I I'm very ordered happy. The, um, the first Joe Prider book from you, and that was a nice little surprise. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I just put that link in the chat. That's paulkirchner.com, and I encourage everyone to go check it out. Uh, any anything else you wanted to add, Paul? Um, well, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing people at uh, MoCA. I, um, I'll, as you said, I'll be at the Tanabis table with my uh, another person from uh, uh, Maybelline uh, Schwarzkopf from uh, France, and I love I love talking to people and uh, look forward to it. Okay, and I'll look forward to seeing you in person at the festival, Paul. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. I'm going to. Um... Uh, end the session now, and hopefully we'll see many of you next week, and we'll see some of you perhaps at the MoCA Festival in a couple of weeks too. Paul, thank you so much for sharing so much with us tonight. It's been a real privilege, and this has been a, a great pleasure for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>